Well, last week we began this series uh, called The Name. And what we're doing is we're going through Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and we're learning about what Christmas really is about from the Old Testament perspective. That one day, what would happen is God, a Savior. And so we begin again. It says, For unto us a child is born, speaking of the humanity of Jesus, that he left heaven and became human so that he could die for our sins. Unto us a son is given, referring to the fact that he is the Son of Man. The fact that he is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Aren't you glad that Jesus is the King of Kings? You know, I, I sometimes get frustrated reading the news uh, or watching the news. Do you? Uh, do you ever just look at that and say, how can they be that dumb? All right, I mean, is anybody besides me that thinks that? Okay. Yeah, I see that hand. All right, God bless you. Uh, the, f- the fact is, um, I get frustrated with our government. I'm glad for our freedoms, and I'm very thankful, okay? But one day, one day, there's coming a king that the government shall never end. It'll be on his shoulder, and his name will be King Jesus. And I'm very excited for that. And then it says, and his name shall be called. Now, I want you to notice words matter in the Bible. We believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Words matter. His name shall be called. That's not just a past tense. That's something that is continuous. It is ongoing. In other words, what God was promised to be then, he will be for us now. What the Lord promised that Jesus would do for you Back then, the people in the Bible, God will continue to do for you now. That's good news. His name shall be called. Last week, we looked at the name Wonderful Counselor. We looked at the wonderful ways of Jesus. We looked at his wisdom. Aren't you glad that he's wonderful? Aren't you glad that he is without equal, without peer? He is wonderful. And today we're going to talk about the second name that we find in this passage, Mighty God. And then next week we'll talk about Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. And it says, and of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. You see, there's coming a day when total peace, total peace is coming. Uh, Jesus will rule and there will be peace. And he has made it uh, possible for you and me to have peace peace with God. And that's what he's talking about. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do that. You know what that means? It means that God is so passionate about you. He is so passionate about saving people that he's never going to go back on his promise. The zeal of the Lord of hosts is going to accomplish. That lets you know how much God loves you. That lets you know how far Jesus would go for you. Oh, we get the beautiful uh, Christmas decorations and music, and I love all that. Does anybody here like to watch Christmas movies? I'm a little bit of a sucker for Christmas movies. Uh, Let me just take a survey very quickly. How many believe Die Hard is a Christmas movie? Raise your hand. You, there's no hope for you. That is an awesome movie, but it ain't a Christmas movie, all right? So, uh, but no, the point is that we have a lot of things that we do at Christmas, and they're wonderful. And I love the family traditions, and I love the food, and I love all of those things, but make no mistake about it. The reason that we are able to celebrate Christmas is because Jesus came to this world to be our wonderful counselor our mighty God, our everlasting Father, and our Prince of Peace. Well, I think the name Mighty God is interesting because it shows us two characteristics about Jesus. 
number one, it shows us his person, and number two, it shows us his power. Now, you say, what do you mean by that? Well, his person means that he is a personal God, that he wants a relationship with you. You see, there are many people that have this picture, this vision of God as he's the big guy in the sky and, and like the proverbial little boy that will pull the flies off of a, or the wings off of a fly, uh, that God is waiting for you to step outside of his rules, and the moment you do, he is going to smash you. There are a lot of people that that's who they see God as. And that's why it says in Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who will come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, here's what God wants you to know. He's personal. He will not leave you alone. All the stuff you go through during the week, during the year, in your family, in your job, with your physical health, he's with you. He loves you. He's personal. And he desires a relationship with you. When you are in need or weak, he shows his power. So his person and his power. I don't know how you were, but when I was a kid, I thought my dad was the strongest person in the world. Anybody ever think that when you were a little kid? Man, my dad, I just thought that there was nothing he could not do. He was so strong. I heard about two little boys that were arguing over whose dad was the strongest. One little boy said to the other one, he said, my dad can beat up your dad. The other little boy looked at him and he said, that's no big deal. My mom can beat up my dad, so <laughs> what does that matter? But no, do you remember when you were a child that your dad was that strong person that was there for you? No matter what. He could solve the problem. No matter what was broken, he could fix it. Now, whether it was true or not, that's what you believed. But the difference between an earthly father and our heavenly father and Jesus is he is the mighty God. He is a personable God, but he's also a powerful God. Well, let me just show you three things from this passage that I believe will help us learn about the power of God. And we can celebrate together this, Chris, this Christmas season. Number one, he has power over your fears. He has power over your fears. We all have fears, don't we? We're all afraid of something. I've shared over the years, and you, if you've been coming here very long, you know I don't like spiders. I'm not afraid of snakes. I've caught rattlesnakes with my bare hand. I've caught copperheads with my bare hands. I'm not afraid of them. Miss Peggy, all right, you, not you, all right, not you. She got bit uh, by one. But I've just never been really afraid of snakes. But somehow or another, a spider, I don't know what it is. I think maybe when I was about five years old, I was running through the woods, one of those big black and yellow, uh, I don't know what they call them, weaver-looking spiders. You know what I'm talking about? They're really big. And I just ran my face right into that web. That spider was on my face. And I uh, almost, I almost was raptured into heaven. All right? I mean, I almost died. And f for some reason, I've always not liked spiders ever since. Uh, just this past week, I opened our door from our garage going into our kitchen, and there was a spider on the floor about that big around. And uh, so I did what every man would do. Kim! I'm kidding. I did not do that. She's afraid of them as I am. But I was able to kill it, all right? Um, and if you're one of those people that says, well, you shouldn't kill it, well, then you come get it, all right? Because I'm not going to stay in a, a house with a spider that I'm afraid when I wake up, it will be on my chest, all right? But we have uh, fears, and of course, that's a funny story. But God has power over your fears, no matter what they are. Isaiah 41, 13, I, your God, have a firm grip on you, and I'm not letting you go. I'm telling you, don't panic. I'm right here with you. You ever just been at the end of your rope, and you've tied a knot in it, and you're holding on with dear life, and your fingers are slipping? You just don't know how much longer you're going to make it. Well, God promises, he said, don't panic, don't fear, 
I'm right here with you. You don't have to worry. Nehemiah 9, 32, and now our God, the great and mighty and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love, do not let all the hardships we have suffered seem insignificant to you. You know what he was saying, Nehemiah? You know what he was saying? He was saying, God, can you see me? God, are you aware of what I'm going through? God, are you aware of my circumstances? Are you aware of my pain? He said, don't let it seem like a little thing what I'm going through. And I'm glad that God, when he sees us, he understands and he knows and he promises never to leave us or forsake us. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is when it talks about Jesus that uh, he was tempted in all points like we are, yet he was without sin. He understands He knows what you're going through. No matter what the struggles, you don't have to be afraid. Why? Because he's there. He's with you. He understands. And particularly this Christmas, because I understand that there are many people when it comes to Christmas time and the holidays, they just, they get depressed. They get discouraged. Maybe there's been a loss. Maybe there's been a broken relationship. Maybe... You don't get to do something that you wanted to do. Maybe your family doesn't come around like they used to. Or maybe you're just one of those that you're the high achiever in the family, and you always host everything, and every year you got to top the year before, and you're cooking and cooking and making and making, and you just can't bear to think that maybe someone would come and think that this was not as nice as it was last year, and you just pile stress on top of your stress and on top of yourself. Here's what I want you to know, that no matter what it is that you fear, no matter the difficulty that you have, God is with you. Maybe this Christmas, instead of focusing on all the the stuff you got to do, instead of trying to drive through all the traffic, oh my goodness, thank God for Amazon, I don't have to go out. Uh, and shop in that. I know some of you are like, oh, no, that's sacrilegious. I can't believe it. Well, you go fight the traffic, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pray for you while you do, okay? Uh, the, the fact is, we can get overwhelmed at Christmas, can't we? During the holidays, we can get depressed even. But God says he has power over your fear. Why? He is the mighty God. He's the person that loves you, that wants a relationship with you, He has the power in your life. Well, let's look at the second thing. He has power over your failures. Now, that's a big power. He has power not just over your fears, but your failures. Listen to Micah 7, verses 18 and 19. There is no God like you. I like that. There's no God like him. He said, you forgive those who are guilty of sin. You know what? One of the most difficult things for a human being to do is to admit that they're wrong, to admit they have sin. We know this. You can look around. Uh, I was taught in seminary, uh, basically, before you lead a person to Christ, you have to have them to understand that they need a Savior. They've got sin in their life. They need to be saved. They need to be forgiven. But you know, for most of us, you know what we're really good at? We're really, really good at giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Oh, we don't do so for others. But you know, I mean, if you ask a person that doesn't know Jesus, are they, for the most part, they're going to say, oh yeah, I'm a good person. I mean, when I die, God's going to weigh the good against the bad. And I'm sure that I've done more good in my life than bad. Here's the problem with that. God didn't come, did, Jesus did not come to make you moral. Jesus came to bring dead things to life. And let me tell you something. The the issue is not how moral you are, not how good you are. The issue is you are spiritually dead until you receive Christ by faith. So it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how moral you are. When you're spiritually dead, there's only one hope for you, and that is to be resurrected to new life again. And that's what's necessary to go to heaven. 
not being a good person, not giving nice Christmas gifts at Christmas, not helping little old ladies across the street, but rather to be brought to life again, new life in Jesus Christ. He said, there is no God like you. You forgive those who are guilty of sin, which is all of us. You don't look at the sins of your people who are left alive. You will not stay angry forever, thank God for that. Because you enjoy being kind. You will have mercy on us again. How many are thankful for the mercy of God? Hallelujah, the mercy of God. He has great mercy. He said, you will conquer our sins. I don't know what sin it is that you wrestle with at night, that your conscience struggles with. The thing that you say you're not ever going to do again, and you do it again and again and again. But thank God, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that we are no longer slaves to sin. That when we come to Christ, he conquers our sin. He's the deliverer. He can deliver you from any sin. He said, you will throw away all of our sins into the deepest parts of the sea. Aren't you glad that God has power over your failures? He has power over the sins that you have committed in your life and the ones that you will commit. I have somebody ask me, uh, well, once you get saved and uh, God forgives you your sin, what about all the future sins? What about those? I said, well, if you think about it, all your sins were future when Jesus died on the cross. And so when he forgives you, he forgives you completely. Thank God for his grace. Isaiah 43, verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. You need to let that sink in. God doesn't forgive you because you're good. He doesn't forgive you because you deserve it. He does it for his own sake. And he says, and I will not Remember your sins. Now, does God have a memory problem? No. He's not forgetful. He didn't lose his keys. He didn't wonder, oh, I wonder what time the sun's supposed to come up today. No. The fact is, when God forgives our sins, the blood of Jesus Christ washes our sins away, and the Bible tells us, and by the way, this is what is necessary to go to heaven. This is what is necessary to be justified. This is what is necessary to be made right with God. He will remember your sins no more. And what he does is he looks at us, and all he sees is the perfection of his son, Jesus Christ. And without that, you and I could have no hope. But thank God, he does. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. You've heard me say this before. You can take a globe. Anybody have a globe? We've got a globe at our house. Some of you do. Only one or two people. Uh, I know you have the internet and everything, but it's not as good as a globe, all right? When you take a globe and look at it, one thing about it, you notice that it's round, all right? Uh, I know some people are wondering about that, and uh, they're like, well, the earth is flat. I'm like, oh, you ever flown on an airplane? No, it's not, all right? So anyway, but you can take your finger on the North Pole, on a globe. You start tracing it down. When you get to the bottom, you're, an amazing thing happens. You are no longer going south. And you keep on tracing it up the other side of that globe. Guess what happens? You're now going north. So you go south, north, south, north, and it's not infinite. But the interesting thing You can take your finger, and you can start going west on that globe, and you make one circle, two circles, a hundred circles, a million circles, and guess what? You're still going west. You don't ever stop going west. And then you start going the opposite way. You're going east. And you can do it a billion times, a trillion times, and you are still going east. What is the point? As far as infinity is from infinity, that's how far he has removed your transgressions from you. 
Isn't that good news? Aren't you glad that God has the power over your failures? Well, then here's my last point. He has also power over your future. Now, a lot of times we get all worried about the future. We get all worried because even though we've seen what God has done in the past, we see his faithfulness, we know who he is, we get all worried about our future. But I want to read, I'm going to close today with a messianic psalm. He said, what does that mean? Well, it means it's about Jesus. And uh, as we're going to read in Psalm 24, there's 10 verses. I'm going to read and I'm going to make a comment about it. But to show you how that Jesus has power over our future and how that we can worship him. Here's what it says in Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Hey, you don't have to worry then. If it's all his, what are you worried about? You got kids. You like to take care of your kids. When your kids are growing up, you didn't make your kid fast for four days before he got a meal. You know why? Because you took care of him. And the reason you could do it is because you owned everything in that house and you were capable of feeding that child, right? Um, well, the Bible says that God has unlimited resources. He owns not just what's in the pantry at home. He owns everything, everything, everything. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. Then notice how it describes his power. For he laid the earth's foundations on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? And this is a metaphor talking about going to heaven, living in the presence of God. Who may stand in his holy place? In other words, who can stand before God? Who can stand before God and be justified and be righteous? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. Now, at first reading, we got a problem. We got a problem. If never having told a lie is one of the requirements to stand before God, I got some bad news. Ain't none of us here making it. You say, well, I don't lie. Well, what other lies are you going to tell today? All right? We all lie. The fact is we all have lied. Then he says, only those whose hands and hearts are pure. Now, let me ask you a question. You can be the nicest, sweetest person. You can be so sweet that butter will not even melt in your mouth. I've met people like that. I've often wondered about them. What is wrong with them? All right, so uh, I, I have the gift of sarcasm. I have the gift of cutting, you know, and I have to work on that. The Bible talks about the tongue, right? But let, me, let me tell you something. Only, only those whose hands and hearts are pure. Now, now, now think about this. If your hands are pure, it means you've never done anything wrong. And, and that's one level. But we all know that we've all failed there. We've all sinned. Wait a minute. He also said the heart. Not just what you do, but your motive behind what you do or say. Look, you don't have to train a child how to be selfish, do you? They just naturally know how to do it. How many of you have ever been disappointed in one of your kids and how they treated a sibling or somebody else? Of course you have. You know why? Because they're born with a sin nature just like you and me. Their hands, even though they're innocent, even though they're little and precious, just like you and me, they're born with a sin nature. They're born spiritually dead. Now, do we believe that children go to heaven when they die? Yes, we do. Okay? But let me tell you something. There comes a point when you reach an age where you become accountable to God. You know right from wrong. You know what you're doing. And your heart is no longer pure. And look, we've all been there. You, you ever smile on the outside and in the inner parts of your heart, you're hoping, I hope that a piano falls out of the sky and lands on that person. You know what I'm talking about? We, we, we smile. And we've got, you know, we, we've got beauty uh, on the outside. But when it comes to our hearts, we don't have pure motives. 
So if he says, don't lie, never lie, hands and hearts pure, and never worshiped anything other than God. Well, who's that refer to? How can that be good news? Well, the good news is because of who it's talking about, Jesus Christ, he is the one that makes us that. It's not your hands that God is looking at. It's the Son of God's hands that he's looking at. It's not your heart that he's looking at. It is the heart of Jesus that he's looking at. And it is through faith alone in Christ alone that we are able to enter into the presence of God, not because of our pure hands, not because of our pure hearts, not because we have always spoken the truth, not because we have never worshipped anything other than God, because we all have, we've worshipped a job or a hobby or a person or whatever. We've all failed, but thank God, he says, these people will receive the Lord's blessing. Did you know that many times throughout the Psalms, this word blessing, you know, uh, the original language for the Old Testament was Hebrew. Um, some Aramaic, but mostly Hebrew. And you know that often this word blessing, it's a plural word, which is weird. We don't talk that way. We don't say such people are bless, bless. But that's what it means. It could also mean happy, happy. They're doubly blessed. So what does that mean? Well, I believe what it means is that not only are you blessed in this life, you want a better life? You want less stress? You want more joy? Uh, you want more purpose in your life? Do what these people are described as doing and come to God. Because it is then and only then that you can enter his presence up his holy hill and worship God. What is he saying? He said these people are doubly blessed. They're blessed in this life and life to come. They're blessed now and in the future, in eternity. They have God with them now, and they will be with God forever. That's doubly blessed, isn't it? He says, so with that in mind, let's read the next part. You see, he has power over our future. And he says, open up ancient gates. He, he's calling out people to praise God. He's calling out people to say, you know what? We have a lot to praise God for. Open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors and let the king of glory enter. That's King Jesus. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the king of glory. And then you'll see that word Selah. That's a, a musical term. It's a poetic term that it means have a dramatic pause. It means to stop and think about it. And so look at what the writer of this psalm has said. He said, there is a way to enter into God's presence. There is a way to worship him. There's a way to be able to live with him forever. And it's not by your hands and your heart and your tongue, but it's by trusting in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he alone is the king of glory. He alone has the power to win our battles. He is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's armies, and he alone has the power to win. <coughs> I heard about an old country preacher that read this text, and he loved this text. And he'd go and he'd preach, and every time he would tell the people, he says, the Bible says, the Lord God is a mighty warrior, and my subject today is, you can't whip him. And you know, that may not be the world's greatest theology, but I think it's really true that when you and I, when we try to go our own way, when we try to fight against the Lord, that's a losing battle. He is with us. And, and you need to see that God's not fighting against you. He wants to fight for you. 
And, and when you begin to see God in that way, in that light, it'll change your perspective on life. Then you go from running from God to running to God. Away from him to running toward him. So what is our takeaway? Well, Jesus is the mighty God. That's the takeaway. He is the mighty God. We need to come to him for salvation. He forgives. Uh, worship him with all your heart. Maybe there are some of you that need to recommit to worship him publicly in church or privately in your daily life. Maybe you're facing a fear, a problem, or a challenge. Give all your worries to him. Why? Because he's the mighty God. <laughs> he is the invincible warrior, the mighty God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our mighty God, that you've never made a mistake, that you always win, and that you always know what's best for us. Now, before I finish my prayer, I wonder if today, maybe online or in the room, you'd say, Pastor, I need to receive Jesus today. During this Christmas season, I need Christ as my Savior. Well, I would encourage you today to pray something like this. Dear God, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They died on the cross for my sins, and by faith, I'm trusting you today. I'm asking you to come into my life to give me holy hands and a holy heart so that I can come into your presence. If you'll pray and ask Jesus to do that, he promises he will. If you're online and you do that, click the button at the bottom. Let us know that you prayed to receive Christ. If you're in the room, take a moment and take the next step card and put your information on it that you uh, prayed to receive Christ today and pass it or put it in the offering bucket that will pass in just a moment. Maybe there's another prayer request that you have. Maybe the Holy Spirit spoke to you about something today. We're going to have a prayer team up here at the front and they'll be here to pray with you. If you'd like to pray with them afterwards, then please make your way up and uh, you can pray with them and they'll uh, be uh, available here to help you with anything that you may need. And so I encourage you to, uh, to use them. And, um, and then uh, let's remember that we're dedicating this building to the Lord. As we started last week, we're worshiping him with all of our heart, just like they did when Solomon dedicated the temple. We are um, praying a great prayer that God would use this place. And then we're bringing a great offering. And today, if you'd like to give uh, in the offering, we're going to do that uh, just as soon as I finish my prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for everyone here today. I pray that you'd help us today as we worship you in this offering, that you'd uh, be with us and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen.